The instinct to go home can be overwhelming, but actually doing so is a different matter. It's 1986. The Yankees are a few innings into a game. Their left fielder, Ken Griffey Sr., is supposed to be there, but he's not. He's so miserable as a Yankee that he's decided to stay home across the river in Jersey and skip the game entirely. The team has sent a state trooper to check on him. Sr. ignores him, walks to his car, and drives south as far away from the Bronx as he can get. After an hour or so on the Jersey Turnpike, Senior turns around and drives back. Junior returns for another year at age 40, playing exclusively as a designated hitter. He's hitting 184. He's awful. By certain measures, owing to the level of production expected from a DH, 2010 Ken Griffey Jr. is on his way to becoming one of the worst players in the history of Major League Baseball. Weeks ago, a couple of teammates leaked to the press that Jr. had been found sleeping in the clubhouse in the middle of a game. Jr. didn't deny it, but the betrayal hurt him. Everything hurts, in fact. It's the bottom of the ninth inning on May 31st. He's sent to pinch hit with a man on first. He's got a bad knee, and it makes his swing look terrible. His old swing, the most graceful swing baseball has ever seen, belongs to the past now. He slaps it foul. They put up a Chiron to tease us with what everyone in the building wants to see. Just one more Ken Griffey Jr. walk-off home run. He hasn't hit a home run all year. That is not going to happen. Nick's pitch is low and away. Junior used to love these. He reaches at it like a shop owner shooing a rat outside, serving up an almost custom-made double play. But Justin Morneau can't dig the throw out of the dirt. Junior's safe, despite having lurched to first like a kid wearing his dad's boots. A pinch runner is called, and he leaves the game. That night, Junior picks up a couple bottles of Mountain Dew, gets in his car, and drives east. He tells nobody. His old buddy, Jay Buhner, gets a call from a friend, insisting up and down he just saw Ken Griffey Jr. filling up his car at a gas station in Montana. That's impossible. The Mariners have a game in Seattle today. But it's him. He couldn't stay another minute. He couldn't wait any longer. He misses his family in Orlando, Florida immensely, and he's driving home to him without stopping to rest. It's a journey that, by his account, takes 43 hours. You can doubt him if you'd like. Just remember who you're doubting. He calls his dad three times along the way and tells Senior how happy he is with what he's doing. He just has to go home. There is no press conference, no ceremony, no parade. Just two headlights in the dark. Welcome to the Felix Hernandez era. The crown jewel of recent Mariner history carried the team on his back for years. Well, at least as much as a starting pitcher can, because, you see, no matter how well one pitches, it won't put any runs on the board for his own team. And when it came to run support, forget halfway, Mariner bats generally couldn't even meet him one step of the way. For instance, in 2010, the 24-year-old Hernandez pitched magnificently yet didn't even make the All-Star team as his 7-5 record was deemed too underwhelming by voters stuck in the Stone Age. When the season wrapped up, his 13-12 record was even worse. 
That's because the Mariners scored a pitiful 513 runs that year, the fewest by any team in a full season since 1972. And for Felix, they were somehow even worse. Take a look at the run support his lineup gave him in his 12 losses. Plating four in Anaheim actually serves as an outlier here, having scored an embarrassingly low 10 runs across the other 11 games. Obviously, none of this is any sort of indictment of Hernandez, who was clearly the American League's very best pitcher. Fortunately, there was no doubling down on his egregious all-star snub, and he was able to rightfully win the AL Cy Young Award. To put in context how meager the help he got was, here are each of the 110 instances a starting pitcher's won that award through 2019, sorted by the percentage of their decisions constituted by losses. Before Felix, no starting pitcher to win Cy Young had a mark north of 40. Hernandez at the very top is all the way at 48%. In the time since, Jacob deGrom's topped 40, but that's it. No one else has ever even come close. It requires a special brand of incompetence to take a season so special by a pitcher, yet not even have any inherent advantage in the ball game when he's on the mound. He also did something that's only been done by two other AL pitchers in the 21st century, toss at least seven innings while allowing no more than two earned runs in over 20 different games, with no one in 2010 even in his neighborhood. The Mariners managed to take one of the very great pitching seasons in recent history and completely waste it. Oh, by the way, the other two AL pitchers who have done so this century? 2009 Felix Hernandez and 2014 Felix Hernandez. But I want to focus on a game from 2012 for a sec. Specifically, the afternoon of August 15th with the Tampa Bay Rays in town, though they would have been better off just pushing the snooze button and not bother even showing up. And really, after Felix sat everyone down the first time through the lineup, his own outfielders, for the most part, didn't even need to be there either. Trayvon Robinson, Michael Saunders, and Eric Thames could have just not taken their regular posts in the field after the third inning, and with the exception of just one Ben Zobrist flyout, it would have had zero implications in how the game played out. Because the other 17 of Tampa's final 18 plate appearances resulted in 10 strikeouts and 7 weekly hit balls to infielders. It was also one of just four times ever a pitcher struck out a dozen in a perfect game. Combine that with barely ever allowing a ball to even leave the infield, and a reasonable case can be made that this was as dominant as any pitching performance in the history of baseball. It all culminated at 3.02 p.m. with this corner-kissing changeup that left Sean Rodriguez more frozen than absolute zero in what was truly a crown-earning masterpiece authored by King Felix. He got him! And given that Seattle scored a par-for-the-course, lone, singular run, anything less than that likely wouldn't have been enough. But he made that moot because through and through, Felix was perfect. 34 years, 119 games, it's finally happened! A perfect game by a Seattle Mariner! It was done by the King! That is what's known as the King's Court, the special section in left field reserved by the team every time King Felix takes the mound. No one else ever got that honor, not even Junior. See, even among this pantheon, Felix is special. These were fans who, just a few weeks prior, had to watch their most beloved superstar walk out the door. It was a trade Ichiro had requested. Not only that, it was a trade to the Yankees, who the Mariners were hosting for a three-game series. His first at-bat in pinstripes, just hours after leaving the Mariners, came in Safeco Field. Were this any other team, or any other city, this could have been ugly. And yet, Nothing was going to change their love for Ichiro Suzuki. They cheered him when he gave a bow, and they cheered him again when he smacked an 0-1 pitch in the center field. Look at that space hit up the middle. It was a decision Ichiro had made out of love. 
He knew that he was expensive, that his skills were declining at age 38, and that room had to be made for the Mariners' rebuilding efforts. The Seattle fans, by and large, really seemed to get it. As silly as it feels to reduce an entire fan base to a monolith, it felt that by this point they'd graduated to an elevated appreciation of the sport. They loved the game, and the team, and its people. When you appreciate sports in this way, your happiness is no longer staked to these stupid b &L charts. There are no limits anymore. The love you can send is endless. You can give it to the one who's wearing a different uniform now. The one you're supposed to hate the most. And of course, you can also give it to the one who stuck around. Felix stuck around for 15 seasons, longer than any Mariner in history aside from Edgar Martinez. The following winter, at the peak of his powers, he could have entered free agency and gone wherever he wanted. Instead, he stayed. While the Mariners did pay him well, Felix surely passed up truckloads of money to stay with his team. The one that had been terrible almost the entire time he'd been here. Virtually anyone else with his transcendent ability never would have done that. Junior didn't. Randy didn't. A-Rod didn't. Felix did. And in so doing, he paid a price. In terms of wins above replacement, these are the top 50 pitchers of the 21st century, plotted by the number of trips each of them took to the postseason. A lot of Felix's peers have appeared in the playoffs on a regular basis. The vast majority have been at least four times. Nearly all have been there multiple times. Felix? having lashed his fate to that of the Mariners, is the only one who has never appeared in a single playoff game. Not that he didn't come close. He came so, so close. Major League Baseball had expanded its playoff format to allow for a second wildcard team in each league, and in 2014, the Mariners and Athletics battled for that final spot. The win-loss chart looks like two people trying to avoid a party. Once the A's began to falter, the Mariners timidly abandoned their positive momentum and hid behind them. On the morning of the final game of the season, the spot was still up for grabs. A Mariners win that afternoon, coupled with an A's loss down in Texas, would force a one-game tiebreaker that could spring Seattle into their first playoff appearance in 13 years. And guess who got the ball? The first pitch of the A's game is scheduled about one hour before the Mariners game. Seattle fans in the stadium are likely to hear the final score of that one in the middle of this one. They'll need a distraction, and they'll get one in the form of a Felix Hernandez masterpiece. Felix mowed down the first two Angels, then gave up a single to Albert Pujols. It's all they would get out of him, as he immediately sent Pujols back to the basement with the third out. He was throwing gas, at one point striking out four in a row then coaxing out six straight infield grounders. The ball hadn't even left the infield in more than three innings. After five innings pitched, no earned runs, one hit, no walks, seven strikeouts. On this Sunday afternoon, King Felix was invincible. Mariners fans are intently watching two things, the game on the field and the game on the scoreboard. As any baseball fan will tell you, the latter is an especially nerve-wracking experience. It tells us so little, but it does tell us that in the bottom of the ninth, with a man on first, the Rangers have the beginnings of a rally going. On the field, meanwhile, the Mariners' newly acquired superstar, Robinson Cano, singles to lead off the bottom of the fifth. Here, everything is as it should be. And it's over. Congratulations to the Oakland Athletics. They hung on. A foul ball sails into King's court. A fan makes a beautiful barehanded grab. They're going crazy. They haven't heard yet, but Felix has. His face here says everything. In his 10 years with the Mariners to this point, Felix Hernandez has never come anywhere near this close to playoff contention. And to this day, he's never come this close again. And God, how he wanted it. With the playoff race over, manager Lloyd McClendon gives Felix the rest of the day off. He sends him out to the mound in the sixth, just so the fans can send him off with an ovation. 
And as such, Felix is officially credited with five and one third innings pitched. This is every start of exactly five and one third innings between 1904, the earliest our available data stretches back, and the end of this 2014 season. In total, there were 9,777. They're plotted here by Game Score, which is a metric developed by renowned baseball writer Bill James. Game Score is a rating meant to assess the overall quality of a pitching performance. Felix's Game Score that day was 73. It appears likely to have been the greatest start of exactly five and one third innings in the history of Major League Baseball. The Mariners have taught us time and time again that no player can do it alone. As a pitcher who, at his best, was capable of completely taking over a baseball game like no one else could, Felix Hernandez came closest to breaking this rule. But even when you can, you can't. The Mariners are out in the great beyond now. Throw away your compasses, they don't work out here. While normal teams experience years-long phases of success and recovery, since 2013, the Mariners have had a losing record, a winning record, a losing record, a winning record, a losing record, a winning record, and a losing record. There's no reasonable way to set expectations for where they'll end up in any given season. This is the footprint of a team that refused to truly, fully rebuild. And who can blame them because rebuilding is boring? Instead, they did something they'd never really tried before. In the 90s, they built their teams from the ground up. Drafting Junior and A-Rod, landing Randy in a trade as an afterthought, and signing Edgar out of a General Electric factory. The makeup of the unbelievable 2001 team was a lot different. They landed one megastar at a great price and surrounded him with a rock-solid supporting cast. In the aughts, they became relatively big spenders in the free agent market for the first time, landing Adrian Beltre and Richie Sexton. But this time, they seemed to wonder, what if we pay an absolutely gigantic pile of money to one guy? Hey, what was that lesson we've been learning over and over and over for the last 30 plus years? That one person can't bring a team to greatness? Ah, what the hell. It was one of the most unexpected free agent signings ever. And it was as though they were trying to counteract the tide of history. Randy Johnson later went on to become a Yankee. So did A-Rod, so did Tino Martinez, so did Ichiro. Thanks to his undying blood feud, the Yankees never could have had Junior, but they could have had just about anything else they wanted. And yet, it was the Mariners, the team that almost never made a splash in free agency, who came out of nowhere to pry a superstar second baseman out of New York. 10 years, 240 million bucks. The Mariners, of all teams, had given out one of the largest contracts in the history of sports. And the architect behind the deal was his agent, Brody Van Wagenen. Do me a favor and remember that name for a minute if you could. Anyway, Cano and Van Wagenen made off like bandits because at the time of the deal, Cano was already 31 years old. There was no denying how great of a player he was, but the Mariners should have known he'd regress in his 30s. He did. Though Cano was still quite productive, only two of his five seasons in Seattle were Cano caliber. In 2018, Cano was popped for allegedly violating the league's PED policy and suspended for 80 games. After the season, the Mariners were lucky enough to escape this deal when they flipped him to the Mets, who assumed most of the remainder of his contract just in time to watch his numbers completely bottom out. Aside from Cano, the big winner in this deal was Brody Van Wagenen, who pulled off one of the most one-sided deals of the century. The big loser, clearly, was the Mets GM. Who was Brody Van Wagenen? who went from big time baseball agent to front office exec, a career jump I have never heard of before, just in time for him to accept the butt end of his own deal. I have no explanation for this. Maybe he was just trying to be polite. At any rate, Robinson Cano did make the Mariners a slightly better team than they would have otherwise been. The 2016 squad deserves your sympathy. They had the fourth best run differential in the league, scoring 61 more runs than they allowed. That ought to be enough to get you in the playoffs, especially in the new five-team format. But while their neighbors did, they didn't. By a wide margin, the Texas Rangers won the AL West instead, despite a far less impressive run differential. Pythagorean wins and losses solved for this by presenting the record you would expect from a team based on their run differential. Looking at the Mariners' differential, you'd expect 87 wins, which is almost exactly what they got in real life. But looking at the Rangers, you'd expect far fewer than 95 wins, only 82 in fact. 
This suggests that the Rangers got lucky and scored at the right times throughout the season, and if it weren't for that, the Mariners would have handily won the West. This is a make-believe tool for nerds with nothing better to do than count beans all day. That describes me accurately, so let's continue. Here we see the differences between Pythagorean wins and actual real-life wins of every team in the integration era. There are nearly 1,800 teams here. Some got incredibly unlucky, ending with far fewer wins than their run differential would suggest. The vast majority ended up about where you'd expect, give or take a couple of wins. Some got really lucky. But the one team that got absurdly lucky, luckier than anyone in modern times, was that 2016 Rangers team. That outrageous amount of luck is what kept Seattle out of the playoffs that year. Now, the 2018 Mariners, who won 89 games and missed the playoffs, do not feel bad for them. Here's the run differential of every team to win exactly 89 games within the modern 162 game schedule. Most have a very strong differential. All have a positive differential. Except for the 2018 Mariners, the worst team in this sample by miles. Let's visit this chart again. On the list of luckiest teams of the modern era, these Mariners are right behind those Rangers at number two. If this sounded familiar, it's because I stole Alex's script word for word when he talked about 2007, when the Mariners pretty much did the exact same thing. The modern Seattle Mariners are not cursed, they're not hopeless, they're free. The burden of greatness is gone. The age of expectations is over. They're free to luxuriate in what seems today like an endless epilogue, rudderless and profoundly weird, just like they were in the early days. It's certainly true that strange, stupid things happen to every baseball team, but put simply, the Mariners have a gift. Speaking of Mariner gifts, one of them was arguably as shocking a home run as there's been in big league history. Let's reach back just a bit to 2008, now that you're familiar with Felix. We already know all about his pitching prowess, but back when he was just a 22-year-old kid, he hit this grand slam against the Mets in Shea Stadium on just his ninth career at bat. From the Mariners' 1977 birth through the 2019 season, that was one of 233 bases loaded plate appearances by an AL pitcher. It was the only one to result in a grand slam. Okay, that's neato and unlikely, but wanna know what made it exponentially more neato and unlikely? That lone, unique grand slam of its kind was hit off the pitcher who had the very best ERA in all of Major League Baseball that season. In fact, Johan Santana was in the midst of what was arguably the greatest season of his career, a career that earned multiple Cy Young awards. On top of that, he hadn't allowed a grand slam in nearly five years and over 1,000 innings. And that streak was snapped by a pitcher, an AL pitcher, a pitcher who, by his own admission, had never hit a home run at any level of the sport since Little League. There is nothing on this planet that makes less sense than baseball. It turned out to be the penultimate grand slam ever hit by a road player at Shea Stadium. The very final one? Also hit by a pitcher, the Cubs' Jason Marquis. Again, nothing about this sport makes a lick of sense. In 2010, the Mariners took a reasonable gamble on Eric Burns. Once an MVP candidate, Burns was signed for the minimum after a couple of injury-filled years that nearly took him out of baseball altogether. The first few weeks were really rough for Burns, who was hitting just 111 but the Mariners were playing 500 baseball. On April 30th, they took the Rangers to extra innings with a chance to snag a winning record. In the bottom of the 11th, with Burns at the plate and Ichiro on third, manager Don Wakamatsu calls a suicide squeeze. If successful, there are few more exciting ways to win a baseball game. The idea here is that Burns bunts, the lightning fast Ichiro bolts for home before the ball's even left the pitcher's hand, and he slides into the plate before Frank Francisco can cleanly field the ball and toss it to the catcher. This is always an extremely risky call, because the whole thing all depends on Burns being able to make contact with the bunt. If he doesn't, Ichiro will be completely hung out to dry. Burns has to get his bat on it, no matter what. The 11-year veteran squares to bunt. Francisco delivers. The pitch is headed low and outside. What are you doing? <laughs> it defies explanation. 
With Ichiro's fate on the line, Burns pulls back the bunt. He seems to immediately realize his mistake, reflexively poking his bat back over the plate even though the pitch has been thrown already. This is now a homicide squeeze. Ichiro, because he's Ichiro, almost pulls it off anyway, getting to the plate mere milliseconds after the tag. This would have been the game winner. Instead, Ichiro's out, Burns strikes out to end the inning, the Rangers win it in the 12th, the Mariners kick off an 8 game losing streak, they never get anywhere close to 500 again, and they finish with 101 losses, the worst record in the American League. Remember the story of Junior's epic 43 hour exodus from Seattle, the one that happened a month later? Well, here's an extremely poor man's version of that story. After that suicide squeeze debacle, Burns went to the clubhouse, got on his cruiser bike, rode through the stadium tunnel, nearly ran over his general manager, and kept on riding out at Safeco Field all the way to his home in downtown Seattle. This was his life now. Eric Burns retired shortly thereafter, becoming a triathlete, and now rides his bicycle thousands of miles across the country. This is like something a sim would do. In literally riding out of the clubhouse on a bicycle, he seamlessly and immediately reassigned himself from baseball player to cyclist. Amazing. Spectacular. I'm in awe. Throughout the first 43 years of Seattle Mariner baseball, 331 of their 1921 regular season road losses came when their opponent was batting and walked off victorious. That was more than every other team in their league except Toronto, but they found one way to lose that escaped even the Blue Jays. While the overwhelming majority of the Mariner walk-off losses obviously stemmed from allowing game-winning hits, in their quest for thoroughness, they managed to lose on a play in which they recorded a strikeout. On September 29th, 2010, the M's are nursing a one-run, eighth-inning lead in Texas before a bases-loaded wild pitch from Seattle reliever Dan Cortez enables the Rangers to tie it up. Gets away! The Rangers are gonna tie it, they do! Interim manager Darren Brown leaves Cortez in the game for the ninth, where Mitch Moreland draws a two-out walk to get the game-winning run aboard and bring Nelson Cruz to the plate. With two strikes, Cruz chases this slider in the dirt in what would have ordinarily sent the game to extras. But it's yet another wild pitch from Cortez, and a poor throw by catcher Guillermo Quiroz go sailing into right field. Moreland gets on his horse and commences a 270-foot victory jaunt around the base path to punctuate a bizarro Ranger victory. And if a baseball game ending on a walk-off strikeout isn't wacky enough, Cruz flirts with somehow making it even way more outlandish. See, upon reaching first on Kiroz's throwing error, Cruz decides to turn and go charging towards second. Logic that would be totally sound had the Rangers been down one or two runs. But they were tied, meaning, with a man on, Cruz represented an irrelevant run. Furthermore, since there were two outs, it's not like he was trying to eliminate the potential of a subsequent double play ball. It was an affront to all rational risk-reward calculation. Fortunately for Texas, the natural instinct in that situation is to fire home, and thus Cruz's brain fart was ultimately harmless, ensuring Seattle the ignominy of the rarest of all walk-off losses. In July of 2011, the Mariners lost 17 consecutive games. To this day, it's the second longest losing streak in the last 30 years of Major League Baseball. But what makes this one special is that during a chunk of it, they managed to fall 10 games out of the standings in a 10 game span. On the morning of July 6th, the Mariners were sitting at 500, and only two and a half games back from the AL West leading Rangers. Just 10 games later, they were 12 and a half back, well out of contention. The odds of your 10 game losing streak perfectly coinciding with a division leader's 10 game winning streak are extraordinarily remote. To simplify things a bit, let's just suppose your odds of winning a game are 50-50, which for both teams is more or less the case. Logically, the odds of you losing and your division leader winning are 25%, or 1 in 4. For that to repeat over the next pair of games as well, that's 1 in 16. As you'd imagine, the number balloons very quickly from here. Now, the probability does ease up a little bit for this four game stretch since the Mariners and Rangers played each other. A Mariners loss automatically meant a Rangers win, so the odds of fulfilling the conditions expanded to 1 and 2. But by the end of it, the coin flip odds of this 10 game stretch sit at about 1 in 65,000. 
This has happened at least once before, most recently to the 2002 Detroit Tigers, but that was at the start of a season with low expectations to begin with. The Mariners suffered this humiliation in the middle of a playoff race. They were right in the thick of it, but at the end of the season, when they finished 29 games out, never would have known it. Well, now that we've reached this era of Mariners baseball, we can finally talk about two players who are very near and dear to me. The first is Jack Wilson. An extraordinary defensive shortstop who on one occasion committed back-to-back -back errors when they tried to make him a second baseman. In keeping with the Mariners time-honored tradition of piecing out without asking anyone's permission, Wilson was so dejected that he went straight to the clubhouse at the end of the inning and decided not to come back out. In terms of defensive wins above replacement, Wilson ranks among the top 50 defensive players of all time. He's pretty underappreciated, in part because he wasn't a great hitter, and in part because he spent most of his career playing for terrible teams. But he made some incredible plays, the most memorable of which is probably this one from April 4th. Wilson manages to drag his toe across second, then turns to fling it to first despite his momentum carrying him in the opposite direction. Jack Wilson only played for the Mariners for a short time, but it's all the time he needed to perform the two miracles necessary for Goofus Maluva's sainthood. The first came in July of 2010. Near the end of a 13-inning game, Wilson runs down a bouncing ball up the middle, spins, double clutches, and with a grand flourish, whips it to first. I can hear the sirens of the baseball police getting closer. Let me guess, you have to have the baseball in order to throw the baseball? Such limited thinking. The second of his miracles is more understandable in context, but it's still really funny looking. An errant throw to first sends the ball into foul territory. After initially chasing it down, Wilson does what is probably the correct thing to do, which is to peel off and let Ichiro take it. It's just the way he does it. <laughs> You see, most of us saw this play as an animated GIF. In fact, most of us knew Jack Wilson just through GIFs. This is all we saw or knew of him at the time. A tremendously talented man. A man with a soul. A man with hopes and dreams. Was bottled up into a dozen of the funniest looking frames of his life. Our other hero is Raul Labanez. Whose career arc is one of the strangest I have ever heard of. For one, he had three separate careers with the Mariners. He was sort of a passing comet, having visited during the Death Star years of the late 90s as well as the malaise of the mid-aughts before making a farewell tour as a 41-year-old in 2013. Far weirder though is how late of a bloomer he was. In fact, as power hitters go, Ibanez was the latest bloomer in the history of baseball. These are the guys who hit the most home runs from their age 30 seasons onward. In this category, he hit as many as Manny Ramirez, and nearly as many as Willie McCovey and Ted Williams. If you're shocked to see him here, believe me, I was too. Now, let's take these top 25 and see how these same guys rank all time in the under 30 home run category. As you'd figure, all the usual suspects like Barry Bonds, Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth, and Willie Mays were also one of the best ever young home run hitters. Some were late bloomers, with Andres Galarraga ranking around number 500 and Nelson Cruz in the 700s, but nobody is in the same universe as Raul Ibanez, whose home run total before age 30 ranks number 1,925. He only hit 27 home runs in his 20s. And while he hit the vast majority of his home runs in his 30s, what's unbelievable to me is that he hit nearly twice as many home runs in his 40s as he did in his 20s. It's bewildering, but it's in left field where he achieved the two miracles necessary for sainthood. On August 6, 2013, video made the rounds of Ibanez chasing down the ball, squaring up toward the infield, and throwing it to 27th base. He's not the only one ever to do this. Once in a blue moon, the ball just slips out of a fielder's hand. It happens. But I knew I'd seen him do this before. May 3rd, 2008. Today, this moment, in which he did the exact same thing, lives on only through a gif. It probably would have been instantly forgotten were it not for our Mariners blog, Lookout Landing. Take a look at all these games, more than 2,000 of them since 2005, and know that the bloggers and commenters of Lookout Landing were telling the story of nearly each and every one of them, inning by inning. They could tell you stories for hours and hours, stories Alex and I have no clue about. If success were all that mattered, these people would have bailed a decade ago. To stick around requires what they might call madness, but what I would call an evolved spirituality. 
a superior understanding of sports and what they can offer us. Oh, hey buddy. On September 13th, 2014, the Mariners woke up with an 80 and 66 record and were right in the very thick of the AL wildcard picture as they prepared for the second game of a huge series versus an A squad that we already know Seattle was in fierce competition with for a playoff spot. Both teams have their ace on the mound, so runs are likely going to be at a premium. The Mariners look to get on the board first when Logan Morrison draws a one out walk. Next, catcher Mike Zunino hits a sharp ground ball to Oakland second baseman Eric Sogard, who flips to shortstop Jed Lowry to try and initiate a double play. Now in baseball, you see base runners from time to time take pretty wide slides in an effort to break up potential double plays. But the rule is that when sliding into a base, your body has to stay within arm's length of the bag. Here is Logan Morrison's attempt to break up the double play. Unless he plans on morphing mid-slide into Inspector Gadget, this is problematic. Morrison's a big dude, listed at 6'3", and honestly, I'm not sure he's even within body length of the bag, let alone arm's length. The umps make the easiest interference call of their lives and award Oakland an inning-ending double play. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered and Zunino would have been thrown out anyway, but we'll never know what may have happened. What we do know is the Mariners went on to lose that game by a single run. Had it gone the other way, the Mariners, not the A's, would have snagged the AL's second wildcard spot. Sometimes the Mariners are contagious, and just being on the same playing field as them can infect you with Marineritis. Such as the next year on July 26th with the Blue Jays in town, when Toronto kicked off the top of the fourth by getting runners on the corners with none out. Up comes second baseman Ryan Goines, who hits a ground ball to Mariner first baseman Mark Trumbo, who promptly steps on the bag for one out. One Blue Jay, Kevin Pillar, gets caught in a pickle. Then the other Blue Jay, Ezekiel Carrera, gets caught in a pickle. Somehow this inexplicably ends with a rendezvous between the two at third base. That is not allowed in the sport of baseball, so the latter inhabitant, Pilar, is ruled out. But wait, there's more. From out of nowhere, an extremely muscular ghost descends upon Safeco Field to shove the other Blue Jay, Carrera, off the bag. Tag applied, third out. I have not seen every triple play in the history of baseball, but I'll be damned if that's not the stupidest. If anything about this story has reminded you in any way of the larger world out there, the one in which these decades have felt like centuries, that was a pure accident that I sincerely apologize for. This is the value that baseball brings, the Mariners especially so. Nothing necessarily belongs to a greater theme or narrative arc, although it sometimes does. Nothing is scripted, nothing is achieved, nothing is taught, nothing is learned. Things are only meaningful as long as we decide they are. It's purely a celebration of human beings at their best and weirdest, and the bizarre, accidental stories they tell within this moon colony. A Seattle Mariners game is a window into what our world might be like if we didn't have important things to do all day. The Mariners have been a reflection of their time in one way, albeit by accident. Their era coincides perfectly with the rise of the individual in our culture. The idea of doing things collectively ebbed in favor of doing it all yourself, whether through the 80s barrage of self-help books, the pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps lunacy of the 90s, or the rise-and-grind bullshit of modern times. Similarly, the only plaques or trophies these people would win were the ones they could go and get themselves. The Mariners are almost like an MMA training camp in this way. They don't compete for team titles, they provide a platform for the pursuit of individual greatness. As always with this team, this requires you to reconsider what a team is and what a team can be. It's not a shortcoming, it's simply the way they operate. Randy Johnson was the first in this pantheon to enter the Baseball Hall of Fame. After his years in Seattle, he started a new, entirely different baseball life at age 35 winning four straight Cy Young Awards and leading the Arizona Diamondbacks to a World Series title in only their fourth year of existence. And that's how the Diamondbacks, a franchise 21 years younger than the Mariners, saw their hat represented on a Hall of Fame plaque before the Mariners ever did. Of course, Seattle didn't have to wait long.
I'm not sure any American athlete has ever been more universally loved than Junior. Junior even melted the hearts of the notoriously cranky Baseball Writers Association of America. The ballots are confidential, and the last 5 or 10% of the voters are Holstein cows who leave immortals completely off the ballot for reasons they'll never have to explain. More than 5% failed to vote for players like Ricky Henderson and Willie Mays, which should tell you something. But even they showed up for Ken Griffey Jr. He wasn't merely a Hall of Famer. He was a man who received more than 99% of the Writers Association vote. The most in the history of Major League Baseball at that time. More than Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, or Willie Mays. A man who had never played in a single World Series. A Seattle Mariner. In his Hall of Fame speech, Junior paid tribute to Senior, thanking him for everything he'd done for him. And he made a decision to play baseball to provide for his family. Because that's what men do. And I love you for that. Both men could barely get through it. It was a far different story for Edgar Martinez, the night shift factory worker who managed to claw his way tooth and nail into professional baseball, didn't play his first major league season until age 27, suffered injuries that relegated him to a DH role, and overcame vision problems that almost ended his career. Somehow, through all of that, he became one of the most dependably great hitters in the history of the game. Edgar is one of just 18 players to finish with an OPS of 1,000 at least five times while taking at least 600 plate appearances for each one. That's where the dependable part comes in. What's most remarkable is while the others started racking up these seasons in their early 20s, Edgar didn't even get going until age 32. He did it through home runs, yeah, but also through an unparalleled ability to smash doubles, hit in all directions, and practice unbelievable play discipline. He mastered the art as almost no one else ever has. If he hadn't, would the Mariners have gotten every single one of the wins they needed to force that tiebreaker in 95? Would someone else have hit that double? Would the Mariners exist today? Edgar's status as a career DH severely damaged his Hall of Fame candidacy, as though it was his fault that the DH is a position in baseball. Like all players, he had 10 years of eligibility to break the 75% threshold necessary for a plaque. In the first six years, his candidacy went nowhere. But Junior and Randy started campaigning for him. So did other stars around baseball, who told stories of how scary he was to pitch against. Whatever the reason, in true Edgar fashion, he peaked late. And in his final year of eligibility, he was voted into the Hall of Fame. Along with Junior and Randy, he joined Dave Niehaus, who received the Ford C. Frick Award from the Hall just a couple years before he passed away. The only remaining question mark from these years is A-Rod. After leaving Seattle, he turned heel. He was resented by fans and the media for any reason they could come up with. How much money he made, his contract dispute with the Yankees, the fact that he was not Derek Jeter, the steroid use he eventually admitted to. Meanwhile, he was busy cobbling together not one, but two Hall of Fame caliber careers. This is the OPS of every man in baseball history to play at least 1,000 career games at shortstop. And this chart is the same story, only for third base. A-Rod, whose trade to the Yankees necessitated a move to third, fares pretty well on both leaderboards. By this standard, he is the very best hitting shortstop of all time. He is also, by a nose, the very best hitting third baseman of all time. A-Rod is the anti-junior, the teen phenom from Seattle who did choose to use steroids, who was willing to play for the Yankees, who did eventually win a World Series ring. It's a hobby among baseball fans to wonder what Junior might have accomplished if the fates hadn't taken a sledgehammer to his 30s. Well, maybe in Alex Rodriguez we see the answer. Thanks to his admitted steroid use, there's no telling exactly what the voters are going to make of A-Rod when he becomes eligible for voting in a couple of years. Maybe it hurts him. Maybe he's been rehabilitated by his second life as a CNBC dork. I really hope he makes it in. I love this goofus. In 2019, the Mariners started off by winning 13 of their first 15 games. That was the very most in Major League Baseball, and in fact was so remarkably good that going back over seven decades, 
21 of the other 29 teams have failed to ever begin a season by winning that many of their first 15 games. The Seattle Mariners had never started this hot. Even in their historic 2001 campaign, they only won 11 of their first 15. But then... The 2019 M's immediately dropped 37 of their next 49, also the very most in MLB, and a run so remarkably bad that six other teams throughout that same period have never suffered that many losses in any 49 game stretch. Again, a preposterous fluctuation of historical highs instantaneously plummeting to historical lows. Only the Mariners. It was all part of a season where, thanks to no shortage of injuries, ineffectiveness, and blowout losses, Seattle used 42 different pitchers, the most in Major League Baseball history. They broke the record that they themselves tied just two years earlier. The Mariners had now gone a literal generation wandering through the MLB abyss. There are actual human beings on this earth, born after October 2001, who have reached adulthood without ever having existed during a Mariners playoff run. And across those pesky 18 seasons that followed their 01 postseason qualification, in which they failed to make a single return trip, 28 of the other 29 MLB teams had secured multiple playoff appearances. And even the Marlins get a pardon for parlaying their lone trip into a world championship. This was the year the last two great Mariners said goodbye. When they began their season with a series in the Tokyo Dome, a 45-year-old Ichiro Suzuki suited up to play two final games. He was purely set up as a crowd pleaser, as his abilities were mostly gone. Mostly gone. In Ichiro's final plate appearance, the oldest outfielder to start a game in more than 100 years came this close to legging out an infield single. Junior had made the trip to Japan so he could be there to greet him. Also there was Felix, who was now the last truly great Mariner left. For the last 30 years straight, the Mariners had always had at least one iconic player on their roster. But while Ichiro is a guaranteed lock to enter the Hall of Fame the second he's eligible, things aren't as simple for Felix Hernandez. Felix's fastball regressed, and as he struggled to adapt, his effectiveness has disappeared. In a hurry, he went from great to good to average to terrible by Major League standards. Being a Seattle Mariner, pennants and World Series titles were never in play for him, leaving things like a Hall of Fame plaque the only hardware he could aspire to. Five years ago, he seemed destined for one. In 2020, as he approaches just his 34th birthday but struggles to remain in the major leagues at all, it doesn't seem likely. Felix had stayed in Seattle and had given this team and these fans every piece of himself until there wasn't much of anything left. The team was going to move on. When he took the mound for the last time, everyone knew it was the last time. It's true that his final start was a loss that dropped his record to one and eight on the season, that he allowed five hits and four walks in five innings and change and that the Mariners were lucky to only be losing 3-1 to one when he left the mound. It's true that just weeks later, the Washington Nationals would win a championship, leaving the Seattle Mariners as the only team in Major League Baseball that has never even appeared in a single World Series. But when I watch him say goodbye, and when I watch the Kings Court pour out enough love to last him through whatever comes next, I mean... The King and his court won final time. Who gives a shit? What is next? Well, I suppose it's a matter of whether the last 43 years were an accident. Did the Seattle Mariners stumble blindly into the most bizarre stories and fascinating people, generation after generation, purely by chance? Or are there reasons? Are they eccentric because their lack of conquest on the field affords them to be? Are they so geographically remote that the ceaseless march of the normal can't reach them? Do their fans love them so unconditionally that they're allowed to ferment into something so captivating? Are they touched by God? Will they always be like this?
before he vanished forever. Nearby resident Roger Smotis, who suggested the name of this team, also supplied an explanation for why he liked the name. I've selected Mariners because of the natural association between the sea and Seattle and her people who have been challenged and rewarded by it. <laughs>